Welcome to Podcetera. Each episode is a journey of discovery as we delve into topics that pique our curiosity and yours. We feature in-depth interviews with fascinating individuals who have extraordinary stories to share. I'm Renee Lego. And I'm Joelle Ludovich. And this is Podcetera. Paul Cater Deaton, welcome to Podcetera. Delightful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. You've had an incredibly varied career from being a movie grip to underwater cinematographer, from writer to MC, director to production manager, plus, 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 plus. Before we dive into all that, let's discuss life before film and video. Tell us where you grew up. Tell us about your family and your upbringing. First of all, with regard to the many hyphens in my uh, job descriptions, basically anything to keep from getting a real job at this point. I spent my youth, my very early years until about age six and a half on a ranch outside of Houston in a place called Crosby. And it was a really cool place to be a kid. I learned how to ride horses. I learned how to brand cattle and, and, uh, and do all the things that one does. I went out on roundups with my daddy. I saddle trained my first horse when I was nine. I've never been thrown, and although a number of them have tried to throw me, that doesn't mean that I've been in the rodeo trying to ride the bucking broncos or anything. But I learned a great many wonderful life skills growing up on that ranch or spending the first six and a half years of my life there that have really come into play as I grew older. Ironically, it's also where I began my love affair with the sea. In about 1959, I was a six-year-old little cowboy. I was watching one of my favorite TV shows, Sea Hunt. And I just loved Sea Hunt because I thought, oh my goodness, there's a whole nother world down there. Who knew that little innocent little moment in time would lead to a life of adventure that I could never have seen coming as a six-year-old little cowboy growing up on a ranch in Texas. And it it really made me wonder about what was, what else was under there. And so we, I I learned how to snorkel. I would go swimming around in the lakes and, and rivers and wherever I was that there was a body of water, I would put on a mask and go check it out. Years later, I learned how to dive, and uh, I was living on uh, uh, in Port Isabel uh, at the time and learned how to dive on, in uh, South Padre. And so my first uh, big open water dive was on a drilling platform off Fort Mansfield, and I just, I never looked back. I mean, it's just, it's such a fascinating world. So from there, my father had multiple sclerosis, and so we had to move to where the weather was warmer, and we could still be in, a, in the country. And so we moved to Harlingen. I spent the, a lot of my life there through about the second year of college. I was going to what was then called Pan American University. It's now University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. I don't know what they call it now. It's gone through a couple of iterations, I think. And then I left there and went to San Marcos to Southwest Texas State. I majored in English and minor in journalism because I was always a storyteller and wanted to be able to be a little bit more fruitful and exacting about it. And so it has served me well, I think, through the years. Moved from there to Austin. I was in Austin for about 23, 24 years, then moved to the Virgin Islands. And I was there all all in. I was there 19 years. I kind of went between there and Austin a couple of times. And so after the hurricanes of 2017, back-to-back Category 5s, I thought, well, now's my chance. (laughs) So we came back to Texas and uh, ended up here in Galveston. I say we, my other half, Monica, is a a photographer. We met on the island. We were actually both members of an online organization called Travel Buddies. And you get on this database. So if you're going to go to some place that's new to you, you looked up in this database if, if, to see if there was somebody who lived there so that they could give you local intel, tell you some of the things that they had to see while they were visiting, some things to avoid, whatever. And uh, I got an email from this delightful Midwestern girl asking, you know, do you think we could have lunch and you can tell me some things about St. Thomas? And I said, well, of course. Uh, and she came down 
on uh, December uh, 22nd in 2008. And I mean, long story short, we've been pretty fairly inseparable since. Four years later, she moved to the islands and lived there with me for five years. And then the hurricanes hit. Fortunately, she had gone back up to the Chicago area to see family and to take care of some other things and was gone before we even knew that the first hurricane, Irma, was going to be a thing. I was there and she saw that these things were heading our way. And I said, well, you're, you know, you're in a safe place. You're out of harm's way. Stay there for a while. And Hurricane Irma comes in. And I had to spend about four and a half hours with my hands and one knee pressed up against the only place that we couldn't board up in our apartment, which was a glass door. And because I couldn't board it up and then get back in the house. So I had to kind of sense what the wind was doing and give it some opposing pressure to keep it from busting out and coming in, uh, into, the, into the house. The winds were sustained at about 180 and gusting to in excess of 225, which was blowing things up the little valley and hitting our house, you know, stones, uh, limbs, probably the occasional iguana. And they breached uh, the windows in one of the rooms that had the, the highest, the heaviest exposure, one of the corners. It started a maelstrom inside or a kind of a tornado and it breached the windows and things started going out the window and then, oh man, I like that hat. I had a week to clean all that stuff up. And so, I mean, hard labor, 18 hours a day or thereabouts, shoveling up broken glass, uh, trying to, to mop up all the water, trying to board up windows and do all the things that I had to do to try to save what I could of our home and belongings. Because a week later, I had a flight to Croatia for a documentary. And I spent a week going, there's no way I'm going to do this because the airport busted down. They were only accepting military and emergency flights. So I went down to try to hitch a ride at the marina because there's a faction down there called the Puerto Rican Navy that always mobilize, it's reciprocated by people on the islands, the Virgin Islands. This flotilla will go back and forth between Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, bringing assistance to the islands. And so I went and, and just hung out down there for about an hour, basically sticking my thumb out, you know, can you give me a ride to uh, Vieques? And uh, a dentist and his girlfriend were kind enough to take me down there. My friends from the CBS affiliate and San Juan, came and picked me up all the way out in Vieques. They had not been hit very hard by Irma. And then they put me up in the corporate condo overnight and got me to the airport in the morning in time to make my connections. And I got to Croatia. But that was a pretty interesting experience, to say the least. Paul, I never have asked you about the name Cater. Is that a family oh, name? It is. Can you tell us about it? I'm named for my grandfather, Paul Cater. And I use all three names for a couple of reasons. Reasons I'm first very proud to have been named for him because he was a fine man. He was a Marine. He worked at, I, I guess it was called Standard Oil of New Jersey at first, and then, then Exxon, blah, 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 blah. And he was pretty well known there. His father-in-law was even better known. I, I'll tell you a quick story. I was there as key grip for a commercial. They brought out the CEO her name was Sherry. And, and so I was talking with Sherry during a reset and telling her that my grandfather used to work here. She said, really, what's his name? I said, Paul Cater. She goes, I've heard that name. Then I said, and his father-in-law was Jesse James Harrington. And her eyes got real big. She goes, Jesse James Harrington was your great grandfather? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, that guy's kind of a legend around here. My grandfather was gone by then, but my grandmother was still alive. And she was very pleased to hear that her father was still held in such a, a high regard and esteem all those years later. It was very gratifying for her to hear. The three names down in Texas, you don't get that up north. <laughs> yeah. Well, I do that, as I said, because I'm proud of the name. And also, uh, I joke that it reminds me of when my mom was mad at me and used all three. I always followed by, you just wait till your father gets home. <laughs> Paul, could you tell us a little bit about how you got started in the film industry? I've always been of the opinion things happen for a reason, that there's kind of a rotation. And preparation that you don't even realize you're making when you're young or whatever 
sometimes comes into play later on in life. So having known since I was about four years old that I wanted to be a freelance photojournalist, which means that I wanted to travel around the world writing articles about exotic people, places, lifestyles, cultures, and then sharing and taking photographs and then sharing them uh, through magazines and, and newspapers. And so that's why I concentrated on English when I was in high school. And then in 1978 in Austin, and Rene, you'll know of this place, 501, Texas Pacific Film Video. And a friend of mine was a special effects guy, and he was working at 501. And he said, hey, they need somebody to come and be the building manager, which was really kind of a glorified term for a custodian. You know, if, if something broke, I fixed it. If something got dirty, I polished it, whatever. Immediately, they kind of identified that I would you know, be very useful and industrious on, on a movie location, on a film set. And so I became a, a grip almost immediately. First, I worked at the uh, prop shop. Within about six months, I found myself uh, clapping a sink slate in Willie Nelson's face. I got to work on uh, Honeysuckle Rose, which was really interesting. And it, it just... Uh, I, I worked with them for like five years and then got into freelance work. And it's taken me by now all over the world. It's just been a fascinating ride. But it's my, my point is that you never know what's going to happen. If you're, if you're prepared for it and an opportunity arises, you have a pretty good chance of being able to seize said opportunity and, and make something of it. How did you sort of bring together your love for diving and filmmaking, your cinematography work? That was an extension of uh, photography. And, and as I said, if one is prepared, uh, you, you're better suited or better able to seize an opportunity. And so when I was living in uh, Port Isabel, working for a newspaper and magazine, I went diving and for the first time got certified down there. And I was already a photographer and had been for decades. And I, I got into diving more for the photography. Just the things that you can do underwater with a camera. Are, are just phenomenal. I, at first, I was shooting stills, and then I went to uh, Cozumel and started using a uh, video camera for the first time. There is really very little or no limit to your mobility down there, and when you light up the reef, especially at night, it just, boom, it explodes. It, it comes to life in amazing ways, and, and the colors are just startling and sea life especially is just fascinating to watch i started getting into the fluorescence there's natural fluorescence going on down there and if you use filters and, and lighting to, to kind of accentuate it it's just it, it's amazing i did a film about that called the secrets of the psychedelic reef <laughs> and it was a lot of fun to do that i still need to do more of it i want to go back to the philippines and spend night after night just doing nothing but fluorescence if you're if you're prepared, you have opportunities that will just amaze you. You were one of three original filmmakers who were selected to produce for Ocean in Google Earth. So can you tell us what that project entailed? Well, Sylvia Earl started this and we launched it in uh, February, I think on February 5th, 2008. And a colleague uh, of mine from St. Thomas, a dear friend named Drew Alston, had a dear friend in Hawaii who was a, a photographer that, uh, his name is Ray Hollowell, and he, he does uh, surfing pictures, photographs mostly. And so Dr. S Sylvia Earle's right hand at the time knew uh, Ray and told him about this opportunity. Charlotte Vick is her name. And he got in touch with Drew, who got in touch with me, and they needed content. And Drew knew that by then I had already been in several places around the world and that they needed content for this fledgling uh, property uh, on Google. And so I made a couple of little documentary shorts, I mean real shorts, like 30 to 90 seconds, uh, about these different places and things underwater. And so I populated a, a lot of the world with these little shorts. And then we went to the California Academy of Sciences and launched Google Ocean, as, as Sylvia says. It was, it was an extraordinary event. Al Gore was there. Jimmy Buffett was there. Kind of who's who of really upper level people in the data world. And, and we launched it. And they had purchased all kinds of bandwidth, expecting a pretty big, Kind of response to 
the launch of Google Ocean, and they didn't have enough. It kind of crashed, and they had to scramble around getting more because the response to it was just so huge. And it was a really big deal for me and everybody that was involved. And it kind of springboarded from there. And unfortunately, I don't think they're doing it anymore. I've looked for it, and I don't see it. So there were places like are entities like the Cousteau Foundation and National Geographic and the BBC. And then there were, you know, the independent little guys like myself and Drew Alston and Ray Hollowell and another couple of people that they kind of got attached to it along the way. I think we ended up with like eight by the time we launched. It was a really interesting time and did a lot to kind of solidify my resolve to do everything that I could to help save the oceans because even back then, in 2008, we could already see the signs. Global warming, climate change, call it what you will, is a thing. It's not like a plot to get somebody elected or whatever. I mean, it's happening and it may already be too late. You know, humans, the ultimate invasive species, may have already set in motion the demise of a perfectly good one in a gazillion planet. And so that's why I kind of started migrating from just travel log kind of treatments to my work and getting into kind of more environmental and educational messaging. It's really, really important. I was talking about Dr. Sylvia Earle just now. If your listeners don't know who she is, I'm sure that a lot of them, or if not most of them do, but if you don't, please look her up. I am very proud that some of my work is kind of dedicated to the proposition that we can, if we work really hard on it, turn things around and our precious little blue marble can continue to sustain our lives for a little bit longer. But we have to put everything else aside and make ourselves at least decent stewards of this amazing gift that we've been handed. Our planet is extraordinary. This is a startlingly unique place. You know, we got to take care of this. This summer, we saw extremely high temperatures, water temperatures in Florida, in and around Florida, and I'm sure part of Northern Caribbean. What does this say to you and how frightening and how urgent is this call to make a change now? Well, it's like Dr. Earl says, you know, you, you treat it like your life depends on it because it does. Um, you know, I'm of a, a rather advanced stage now, so it's not going to affect me that much. I've seen the changes. Uh, storms are stronger. It gets colder in the winter and hotter in the summer. The places are drying up. Coral is being bleached. Don't even get me started on the danger that brings to us. So I, I'm, I'm thinking about my grandchildren. I've got nine-year-old twin grandchildren from one daughter and some other younger ones from the other and selfishly want them to be able to survive. At first, I wanted them to be able to see some of the things that I've seen in my experiences around the world, but now I just want them to have enough air to breathe. I want them to have enough water to drink and food to eat and not have to worry about great weather-related cataclysms going on. And, you know, it's not, it's not looking good. I hate to be a doom and gloom kind of guy, but, you know, the facts are there. And if we don't pay attention to them and do something about it right now, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren are, are going to pay for it and ultimately the planet. Sadly, I can't disagree with you. I mean, the science is there. A lot of people kind of disparage science, you know, well, you know, such and such got disproved. Well, that's, you know, science is fluid. As more data comes in, it's ingested in new Conclusions are drawn, but this, the science doesn't lie. And eventually, people are going to just have to understand that, you know, this is something that's way beyond, you know, oh, gee, I get to play golf in February. You know, this is, I mean, this is already causing catastrophic problems all over the world. Can you share any memorable or challenging experiences you've encountered while filming underwater and how did you handle it? Weird stuff can happen underwater, as you can imagine. People always ask me, what's the most dangerous being that you've encountered underwater? My answer, not surprisingly, humans. <laughs> I've seen people do some really stupid stuff down there from uh, just bad buoyancy that makes them just kind of pogo stick all up and down, which can cause problems with, with your ear canal, pulmonary embolisms, whatever, to just outright 
messing up, but I've done some work with sharks. I've filmed great whites. I was in a cage for that. They wouldn't let me out of it. I went to a place off Grand Bahama and filmed a, a documentary there called Showdown at Tiger Beach. And we were in the water, in open water, outside of sight of land. On the last day that we were there, we had 12 tiger sharks in the water with us, the largest of which was 16 feet. And people always ask me, well, weren't you scared? And I tell them, well, I didn't have time to be scared. You know, I say in the film that situational awareness is everything. I was, and I'd say I was looking around, my head was on a swivel so much you to think that I was a, a British fighter pilot in the Blitz. But I also came away with a, with not refreshed, but a, or even renewed, but a kind of an accentuated opinion of the shark as just a very inquisitive animal that that's not really out there to target humans. For reference, I would encourage people to go to my website to the screen page and see a film that I did called The Only Good Shark. But as far as dangerous things, I've been in a couple of situations that were kind of brought on by myself and just not paying attention. I had to untangle an anchor. Again, this was a, an expedition I was on with my friend Drew Alston, and we had a a 360 degree camera. This was, oh gosh, 15 years ago. We were inspired by the cameras that they were using for Google Maps and Street View and things like that, that they would put on the top of these cars and go driving around with them. And they were spherical. They had like 18 cameras in there then and they got stitched together so that you could see all over the place. So a company that we were working with sprung a, a pretty amazing amount of money to, to get one. We had been filming on a shipwreck with this thing. And then we went back up to get ready to go. And the anchor had become fouled in some of the, the cables on this old shipwreck. So I had to go down and free this thing. And so I was blowing a lot of air because there was a lot of wave action and wind on the surface. And so I, I expended a lot of air just trying to heave this thing and the weight of the boat. And I finally got it free and then followed it down to the deck. And I was scooting along the after deck. And I thought, okay, good. And then I went, oh, wait, not good. Because we were getting to, to the very stern and there was another 40 feet down. That anchor was about to drop to. And the boat was moving at a pretty fast clip because of the waves and the wind. And so I had a choice to make. I looked at my air and there was no way I could follow the thing down and then come up without expending too much air. And after having been down at about probably 55 feet for that long and even longer right before that during the film shoot, I didn't want to skyrocket up because there, there was a really enhanced probability of decompression sickness, otherwise known as the bins. And so I just kind of had to angle myself and keep an eye on that anchor line, which I had to release. And uh, I mean, I was this close to running out of air by the time I got to the surface. That kind of opened my eyes a little bit. And I was like, you know, I really need to pay more attention because, you know, in the heat of the moment and being so mission driven can really kind of be detrimental to one's health. And so I, I haven't made a stupid mistake like that again since. You know, experience is a, a, a cruel instructor. But again, operator error, mea culpa. So you are certified in global shark biology, biodiversity and, and conservation by Cornell University. And you gave a highly rated TEDx talk on shark conservation. So with movies like Jaws and news of shark attacks, it's no wonder that the public has a negative perception of sharks, which you sort of touched on a little bit. So how does this perception affect conservation efforts and what steps can be taken to change this narrative? Well, again, I'd, I'd like to refer people to The Only Good Shark which was the topic of my TEDx talk. And the tide is kind of turning. People in Asia, mostly China, there's a market for it because there's a demand. And so that creates the opportunities for basically criminals to go out into the oceans and just go crazy finning sharks. And watch the film and you'll see some of the things that they do. And you'll also see some of the things that are being done to try to stem the tide and to try to get this turned around because sharks are critical. And it's not just about the sharks or the, or the sea. It's about us as well. The air that we breathe, most of it comes from the sea. And if you take sharks out of the equation, that really puts everything out of balance. And it, it's, it can be really, it can be dangerous to all of us. That's 
probably, arguably, part of the the problems that we see right now because there there aren't enough sharks to to keep things in balance. But watch the film and you'll see. There are people like Yao Ming, the the basketball player, Jackie Chan, and others who have joined the educational kind of thrust to make people uh, in China understand that this isn't a really, this isn't a good thing to do. We're happy that you guys got married. Mazel tov. Don't eat the shark fin soup. It's really detri detrimental to the health of our planet and you. And so it's kind of showing some fruits, and, but there's still a long, long, long way to go. How can someone listening contribute to shark conservation efforts? There are a number of ways. There, there are shark savers. That, that's an organization that you could go to. Missionblue.org. Uh, is a really, really good clearinghouse for, for information. Uh, there are a number of ways that people can educate th uh, themselves and others. There are ways that they can contribute uh, funds or resources to kind of help educate other people. And, you know, wa watching films like the ones that I do and my friend, and, and I got to talk about this guy, Richard Morris, Rick Morris, dear friend from New Jersey who just died recently, like last week, week before, just out of the blue. I, I won't go into it, but Rick was one of the most passionate filmmakers I, I ever knew. Rick would get emotional about the, the state of our oceans and consequently our planet and did a lot of work to try to make people understand what was at risk and what they could do about it. And Rick worked with Dr. Earl a great deal the fish census and some other things that they had done over the years. And you will not find a more tireless defender of our fragile blue bubble than Dr. Earl. I encourage everyone who's listening to this to Google that woman and you'll be astonished at some of the things that, that she's accomplished and identified. There, there are a lot of different ways that you, can, that you can help and it begins with educating oneself. If you can see what the problems are and what they are becoming, hopefully it will give some impetus toward trying to create some solutions instead of just watching the, the world go headlong into disaster. You've mentioned Dr. Earl a number of times, and I am not familiar with Dr. Earl. I grew up with Jacques Cousteau. That was the, the conservationist that I knew from the 70s and 80s. So for me, when I think of ocean conservation and marine life, I think Jacques Cousteau. And so in preparing for your interview, I thought about him. And I remember watching documentaries growing up on PBS. And I came across one of his quotes. I wanted to read to you and see what you thought of it. From birth, man carries the weight of gravity on his shoulders. He is bolted to earth, but man has only to sink beneath the surface and he is free. That's one of my favorite quotes ever. Jacques Cousteau totally got it. Almost all, if not all, of his descendants uh, get it as well. I know most of them. I know Jean-Michel. We had dinner together a couple of years ago at a show where I speak very often called Beneath the Sea up in New York. Fabien will be at a show where I'm going to be a presenter in Boston at Boston Sea Rovers in about six weeks. I've known Philippe since he was 16. And it, he's gone on to do some really amazing things. He's the grandson of Jacques uh, Cousteau. His father was also named Philippe. And um, my friend was born shortly after his father's uh, untimely death. And he, he does some amazing work. He's got Earth Echo Foundation. Celine has actually been a backup singer uh, for a band that, <laughs> that I uh, have played in uh, over the years called The Wetsuits, which is the world's first and only band comprising musicians who are also professional underwater camera people. Jacques Cousteau, of course, that one is probably the most well-known and really the most bang on comment about uh, the world underwater. You know, we, we, we do all this uh, exploration of the, the moon. We want to go to Mars, which is awesome. I mean, I cover stuff like that at, at uh, NASA Johnson Space Center and Space Center Houston quite often. Thankfully, NASA doesn't let those opportunities get by them all that often. And they do a lot of things with regard to tracking things that are going on in the oceans. And God love them for that. But it's a completely different world. Seven-tenths of our planet is covered with water. And it's just 
fascinating down there. And when you get down there, it gives you a kind of a different perspective. It's not all just going on up here. The, the, you know, the dry land and, and, and what we see on a daily basis isn't all that there is at stake. There's all this stuff going on down here, too. Dr. Earl says the world has been using our refrigerator as our septic tank, and that needs to stop. You know, there, it, 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 people just don't think about it. Wow, that's a that's a really amazing that's a really amazing quote. Say that again. The humans are using their refrigerator as their septic tank, and I mean, just dumping. Famously, New York City would put their garbage on garbage scows, tow them out into the ocean, and then just drop all drop it all overboard. Huh? <laughs> it's bad enough that it goes into landfills, but into the ocean? Oh, but it's so vast, you know. Nothing, nothing will come of this. Well. Yes, again, y'all. So for me, little girl from Pennsylvania, I knew who Cousteau was. He was internationally recognized, but he had a certain cachet. He had, he was a personality. I don't know as much about Dr. Earl. She doesn't have that same celeb, if you will. Maybe she does in certain circles. Do we need another worldwide celeb spokesperson to elevate and bring awareness again. We absolutely do. We absolutely do. And frequently in Q and A's after presentations that I give around the country at dive shows and other places in, in different parts of the world, I frequently have some somebody like a young lady saying, Well, I want to be the next Dr. Sylvia Earle. And I'll tell them, you know, well, I love your enthusiasm. Don't ever let that Wayne. But we already have a Dr. Earl and she's doing a great job at being Dr. Earl. Why don't you be the first you and, and expand on what you know? Try to get it out in front of as many people as possible. It is a shame that Sylvia is not as well known to quote unquote mainstream. She should be because she's brilliant and she totally gets it. But she's also a member of a group called Ocean Elders which uh, comprises uh, other people like James Cameron, Jackson Brown, Prince Albert of Monaco, a, a number of other people. You can see kind of a more comprehensive list about and things about what they do in The Only Good Shark, and they certainly have cachet. I think that they should use it more. Jimmy Buffett did. Jimmy was at the, at the launch of Google Earth back in 2008, and he, he totally got it, and, and he did a lot to try to let people know that they needed to kind of pay attention to what was going on. I think that, like everybody, he could have done more about it, but he did something, and that's better than nothing. Could I ask a follow-up about divers and cinematographers? Is it a, a small group? I've always been interested and wanted to do, like, underwater cinematography. Is it a small group of you that you all know each other? Oh, yes. Oh, gosh, yes. We know each other fairly well. We appear in the same dive shows and film festivals, uh, mostly around the country and certainly around the world as well. Every time I introduce these two, I introduce them as, you know, when, when it comes to going to the bottom, they're the tops. Howard and Michelle Hall, they do the IMAX movies that have really gotten the most eyeballs of pretty much any of us with the work that they do about the, the, the coral reefs. And they collaborated with Jonathan Bird, another dear friend, uh, on a film called you know, Ancient Caves. And there are people like that. And th there are people like the aforementioned uh, Rick Morris and, and uh, Michel Gilbert and his wife, uh, Danielle Allary from uh, Montreal, uh, who are still photographers, but they bring their work to these shows uh, quite often. It's not terribly tight knit, but I mean, we all know each other and we end up at the same shows together quite frequently. But again, going back to Rick Morris, he did a film that kind of ticked off a couple of the people in the world of what we do. This is about 10 years ago. He did a thing called Phone Home, which was teaching people how to do their own underwater films, putting their iPhones into underwater housings and going down and doing their own films. And while it was decried as, oh, you know, you're teaching people to compete with us, but it's really kind of uh, promoting citizen science. And I think that's one of his more brilliant ideas. People 
taking their little iPhones down or GoPros or what have you. Every little bit helps. And I think that was a brilliant move on Rick's part to make that kind of possibility a, a more mainstream idea. And it's little things like that. Individually, we're a drop in the ocean. Together, we are the ocean. And Rick totally got it. Most of the people that it's my honor to be around at shows like Boston Sea Rovers Beneath the Sea, Diving Equipment and Marketing Association, otherwise known as DEMA, the shows in Asia, of which there are many. And the more Asians we can get involved, because, you know, just mass numbers, the better off the planet's going to be. Uh, Europe has several dive shows that are really coming into their own and have been a staple in this industry for a good long time. So there can never be enough. I look at these people as colleagues and not competitors, because regardless of how we do it, we all shine a spotlight on the problems and the things that desperately need solutions to an ever-growing and ever more frightening problem. And I can never get enough of seeing people do just even, you know, they're trying, for God's sake. And that's better than nothing. I saw the 2020 Oscar-winning documentary, My Octopus Teacher, and it still is haunting me. I wondered what your thoughts are on that documentary. Oh, I've, of course I've seen it. I've seen it a couple of times. It is, to begin with, it's one of the most strikingly, compellingly beautiful films I've ever seen about the underwater world. I mean, it is an astonishing, astonishingly well done. And it's a poignant, emotional look at a fascinating world and a fascinating creature. Again, you know, this is one of the examples of what can happen when somebody puts out a really compelling piece of work. It resonates with people and they go, oh, I never thought of that before. It gives you a look at cephalopods. It gives you a look at some of the problems that, that they see from their very particular perspective underwater. And the way that it correlates with the threats that we see and the challenges that we see and it just, it, it helps so much when something is so good. I will also add that for many, many years, about 20 years, I will not eat cephalopods. I, I don't eat calamari. I don't eat octopus, cuttlefish, or any of that stuff because they are highly intelligent. And I don't want to consume anything that may be smarter than I am. <laughs> you know, there there are other fish that I, that I just don't eat anymore. I used to rather uh, favor grouper. And then I, I met one on uh, a, a dive off Cayman uh, that, that came up and, and got into a kind of a, a heads up kind of slanted uh, position like they do at a cleaning station, signaling to uh, the cleaner fish and shrimp that, you know, I, I'm not going to eat you. Come and help get some of these things off of me. And it came up and I started scratching it under its little neck like I would scratch our kitty cat. And it just, it's, it, it it, like our kitty cat, it would just stay and just take it in for as long as I was going to be there. And finally, I was like, I'm running out of air. I got to go. So I don't eat those anymore. I just hope that I never make friends with any lobsters, you know. Any favorite projects that you want to tell us about? Almost a year ago, I went to Kenya and uh, Tanzania, Zanzibar to be specific. We, we didn't spend any, any time on the mainland. We went straight to Zanzibar and I did a lot of diving there. And we also went to the Maasai Mara at the top end of the Serengeti and filmed a lot of animals there, including from a, a hot air balloon. And so I'm in post-production with that and I'm going to spring it on my first audience at Boston Sea Rovers in about six weeks, 15th or 16th of March. That was a lot of fun. We stayed at a place called Embu River. And as we were getting ready to depart, one of the young ladies that had been driving us around, I, I ran into her and, and she said, oh, did you see the hippos? And I went, no. And she took me to where the swimming pool was at this, at this place and pointed it across the river. And there were these just giant hippopotamus in, in the water. And just everywhere you look, you'd see you know, like a, a big family of elephants or elands or Thompson's gazelles. And then you get in the water and see all this extraordinary stuff. And what was, I think, the most striking to me was that everybody that we ran into in kind of a tourism milieu also was keenly aware of 
the environmental challenges and they were doing what they could do to help the planet. All of the divers that we dove with in both places, in Kenya and Zanzibar, every time that they'd see a, a bit of trash, they would pick it up. One guy and I cleared a, a ghost net off a bomby or a coral head and took it back and disposed of it properly, you know, as opposed to just kind of leaving it there. That was memorable. I look for stuff like this. I find in Atlas Obscura or a Condé Nast Traveler things that are fascinating to me, and I go, oh, I'm going to go do, do a, a film about that. Uh, one that leaps to mind is about a winery in Croatia called Edivo Vina, Vino, which is owned by two guys, Eri Bajurin and Ivo Segovic from Croatia, hence the name Edivo Vina. And they, in addition to aging wines in conventional cellars, they also encase their bottled product in clay amphorae, that, the likes of which that you would see on ancient Greek and Roman and etc. shipwrecks. And then they age them underwater which is practical because it's where they have them. It's kind of darker down there and certainly in the confines of the amphorae, but it's a stable temperature year round. And so in the process, they have them down there for at least two years and they will become encrusted with tube worms and mollusks and different things like that. I mean, when I was diving on one of the big groupings of amphorae with Evo, he pulls out a dive knife and, and opens up an oyster from the side of one of them and just has an oyster right there underwater. And they bring them up, they power wash them and then leave them out to dry off. And then they sell them. And I wish that I had it at my disposal right now. I'd show you my amphora to show you what I'm talking about. I, I'm real sure that there's one in the photo section of my website. But that was fascinating. And I fell in love with all of Croatia, especially Dubrovnik. I have friends there now that are just lovely people. Another good question. So when you're not flying around the world or diving or doing speaking engagements, what keeps you busy in Galveston? Uh, I do a lot of work with an organi a news gathering organization called I-45 Now. And we are um, very hyper-local. Our sphere of, of uh, activity and coverage encompasses Galveston County and the immediate environs to include sometimes uh, South Houston, uh, Bolivar Peninsula, which is just a short ferry ride from Galveston and some other places. That also encompasses uh, NASA Johnson Space Center and Space Center Houston. Lone Star Flight Museum, which is kind of like the CAF, uh, now known as the Commemorative Air Force, but that it's a, a flight museum just north of Webster uh, at Ellington Field, which is a, a, a place that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, every year, the CAF has a big air show there. But I, I do a lot of, I kind of came full circle with my journalism and got back into journalism, particularly television. And I've become one of the owners of the production arm there, which is called Amped, A-M-P-D, Digital Delivery. I'm the PD in, in Amped. And we do commercials and special features, just all kinds of stuff. Sometimes we air some of the work that I've done in the underwater realm. We still have a, a wonderful client, the Clinic of Texas, that does LASIK. And the uh, owner of this, Dr. Bernie Milstein, specifically asked that I let them use some of my underwater footage for one of their commercials. You know, like, if you don't get to see stuff like this and see it clearly, maybe LASIK is for you. So one of the cool things that we get to do is Dickens on the Strand, and a, a kind of an homage to, of course, Charles Dickens. And a great many of his uh, descendants come to this thing every year. And it's visited by tens of thousands of people every year. And, and uh, it's a celebration of Victorian England and uh, the works of, of Sir Charles Dickens. And so Ollie Dickens, his great-great-great-grandson, has become a friend. We've known each other for like five or six years now. Lucinda Dickens Hawksley is a very well-known and popular artist in her own right, or author in her own right. She's been coming to it and uh, a number of the others. And uh, it's just fascinating to be able to spend time with them. I just put up an interview that I did with Lucinda on my Vimeo page yesterday. Fascinating woman. 
So yeah, that's a lot of fun. And boy, talk about a target rich environment for photographs. And you can probably see some of those on my website as well. Okay, we're going to move on to what we affectionately call the speed round. So if you could go to outer space, would you travel to the moon, Mars, or the International Space Station? Well, for right now, the only option is the uh, International Space Station, so I'd have to pick that. And yes, I would do it in, in a heartbeat. I've known some people that have been on the ISS. I've known some people that have been on the moon. I know that the guy that took the call when Jim Lovell called and said, Houston, we've got a problem. And so I, I know that there are certainly risks involved. There's a risk involved with going down to the corner store. For the experience of being up there, I'd risk it. You betcha. Okay. Choose a movie or series title for the story of your life. I can't believe I did it. Awesome. Confessions of the world's oldest living 12-year-old. I don't know. The, the possibilities are endless. And, and this isn't, you know, to be a joke or, or whatever, but I do consider myself to be kind of like the, the world's oldest living 12-year-old in, in many respects. Well, like the, the previous question, would you go to space? Would, would you go to Mars, the moon, or the space station? Since I was a kid, I've been fascinated by that stuff, and I still have that same kind of childish our childhood fascination with, with things. And, and that's in large part what keeps me going. It, it's what keeps me interested and, and inquisitive about the world around us. And, and so that leads to so many other things. Our final segment is called Question Down the Lane. Each episode, we ask our guest to provide a question for the next guest. So our last guest provided a question for you. And that question is, how do you want to be remembered? What is your legacy? I would like to be remembered as, in the words of my late friend and mentor, Stan Waterman, who just died a few months ago at the tender young age of 100. I'd like to be remembered as a gentleman and a gentle man. I would like to be remembered as, as someone who at least tried to make a difference, whether or not I was successful, will probably not be known for maybe even generations. I just hope that I've made some sort of difference for people on the planet. Stephen Colbert has this thing, the, the Colbert Questionnaire, and he says, describe the, the rest of your life in five words. And a lot of people go for independent words. I go for a string of them. I shall do my best. And that kind of sums it up. You know, I'm just I'm, like, uh, you know, I did to make a Star Wars reference, Boba Fett, I'm just a simple man trying to make his way in the universe. And, you know, what I think ultimately all of us hope to have made some sort of impact with our lives so that it, it meant something and so that it contributed something. A lot of my legacy lies with my daughter and her daughter. I, I don't want to sound like, Whitney Houston, but children are, in fact, the future. Just the other day, the head of the neonatal division and, and, and other divisions at the Women and Children's Wing, John Seeley Hospital at the, the University of Texas Medical Branch, Joan Richardson, said children comprise only about 30% of the population, but they are 100% of the future. And so we need to pass along important lessons to our kid because it's all riding on them in as much as it was riding on us and a lot of us flubbed it. And so hopefully the, the, the kids will do a better job of being stewards to this planet, making people more understanding and accepting of each other because right now we're doing a bad job of it right now, largely. Paul, how can our listeners find out more about you and get in touch? Well, I've referred to my website a time or two. It's all three of my names strung together, paulcaterdeaton.com. That's P-A-U-L-C-A-T-E-R-D-E-A-T-O-N.com. A lot of people make it a Carter, but it's not. That's probably the, the primary resource for finding out more about me and what I do. My experiences, my background, my capabilities, part of the body of my work. References to other places, I try to keep a fairly good stable of links to other people. I believe that you'll find Howard and Michelle all in there, Jonathan Bird, 
and others who, who do the same types of work that I do. You can also find me on Instagram. That's more of a personal kind of thing. But on Facebook, Paul Cater Deep Underwater Filmmaker. I, I try to keep some information in there as well. Awesome. Paul, it's been Paul Cater, I should say. We want to use your whole name. Paul Cater Deaton. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us on Podcetera. It's always great to catch up with you. It's been a, like we said at the beginning, it's been a minute. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. It has been an absolute joy, and we do need to catch up in person over a cup of coffee or a can of something. And, oh, my goodness. Thank you, Paul. It's been a wonderful conversation. I could spend another hour and a half with you. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review and share Podcetera. And be sure to follow and like the series wherever you enjoy podcasts. For Podcetera, I'm Renee Lego. And I'm Joelle Ludovich. Thanks for listening. See you next time.